Good evening. Thank you. Welcome to the Bradford County Historical Society. And uh, this is our Friday night at the museum programming series. Uh, just a, a few announcements. Our museum is open Wednesday through Friday, 10 to 4, as well as our research library. And uh, feel free to stop in. Uh, our tour guide out there, Tom Schuster, will be glad to give you a tour of the museum. There are several changes on the second floor this year including a lot of new Indian artifacts that had not been on display before, so uh, you'll want to check that out, and uh, several other changes up there as well. Um, so this evening, we have Rich Goulias here. He's the Environmental Education Specialist at Mount Pisgah State Park, and uh, he helped a lot with setting up the, the new display up there this year and sorting through a lot of new artifacts we had received to uh, bring our display of Native Americans up to date. So we're really thankful for that and glad to have him here tonight. So I'll turn it over to Rich. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, don't go far, Matt. I struggle with technology, so oh. I know there's not a lot of buttons oh. on here, but anyway, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, basically, what I'd like to do tonight is just give you a brief overview of the Native Americans in Bradford County. I know I always get a lot of questions, you know, where were burial grounds, what tribes were here, how long were the Native Americans here for? So I'm just gonna kind of give you a snapshot of that. Basically each one of these slides besides this one, I could probably talk to you all night about and I'd bore you to tears, so I don't want to do that. So anyway, up front there are also a lot of uh, Native American artifacts, the majority of them come right from Bradford County. They were found on various sites here in Bradford County, uh, pretty much exclusively surface collecting. Some of them I did get at auctions over the years that you know, estates went up for sale and I hate to see artifacts go to the four winds, so to speak. So uh, a lot of times people might be there from another state and the artifacts are gone forever and there's really no history or background to them. So uh, what I've been trying to do is compile a lot of the more significant relics in the county there too and uh, uh, can't afford much. I know my wife's back here, she calls them rocks. I promised her I would say something about them. So anyway, luckily they're all in the basement so they don't wear a hole through the floor or anything like that. So they do get quite heavy after a while here. But uh, I'll be here after the program's over too. If you wanna see any of the artifacts, I could talk about them. I labeled quite a few of them. Uh, most of you, I would almost guarantee you'll go, that looks just like a rock, okay? And a lot of them do look just like rocks, but the Native Americans made use of their, na of their natural resources. So they would take stones that you and I would probably take for granted and use those to make cordage, for example, different types of rope, uh, maybe to hunt with, uh, to clean hides, to scrape bone marrow out with, to make pottery. So. Uh, a lot of the things you're looking for, just little marks on them that show that they were used. So, and I'm sure you've all seen different archeological, you know, things, Smithsonian publishes a lot of stuff that they find and you, you look at them and go, boy, it doesn't look like they've ever been used for anything. And they really have. So they kind of develop an eye and I talked to a gentleman earlier and that's really what it comes down to. So, so with that, I'd like to get started. If I go in the wrong direction, I apologize and Matt's gonna help me out. And I have my two sons up front here to do a demonstration later on, just to give you an idea how strong cordage is. So uh, we'll wait for that. But uh, basically the Native Americans lived in Bradford County for about 12,000 years. So uh, most people that I talk to think they were here for about two or 300 years. And you know, the theory is they came over across the Bering Strait, migrated from basically Siberia up in that area came down through North America and populated it. If you went back about 12,000 years ago, how many Native Americans do you think lived here? 12, that'd be a good answer, yeah. There was, they estimate through archeological evidence there was about 500 in the whole state of Pennsylvania. So that is not a lot of people, obviously. So uh, in Bradford County, basically at this time period, uh, they were very nomadic, they would follow the game. And if we turn the clock back 12,000 years, deciduous trees weren't here, it was mostly conifers, the glaciers were receding. Uh, this whole area, if you went back prior to that and you looked up, you'd see nothing but ice. Uh, there was about a mile thick of ice in many areas in Bradford County. So, so picture a mile of ice sitting on top of you, flatten you right out. <laughs> 
And how many of you ever dug in the soil around here? It's where the hard pan comes from, they call it, okay? So uh, it's all compacted from all that heavy, dense ice there. So again, Native Americans, very nomadic. Most of the village sites that I've collected on and other people have found uh, artifacts on were located near natural resources, particularly the rivers and streams. So they would follow these streams. If you have a spring on your property, that's clean water. You could imagine trying to drink out of the river even back then. Okay, there were fish in there, there were turtles in there, snakes, everything else, and they all went to the bathroom in there too. So the Indians would actually pick smaller side tributaries that entered the river and drink out of those, or springs, for example, too, where the water was a lot cleaner. So really important and critical natural resource. They didn't want to go three miles to get a drink. They had to be pretty close to that uh, spot there to get that drink. So. A good spot to look for artifacts is near some of our major tributaries, junctures of streams, but uh, other places too. I know the fellow I talked to earlier said he thinks the one spot was an old beaver pond. And if you turn the clock back, I wasn't here 12,000 years ago, thankfully. Anyway, but uh, there were probably a lot of beaver ponds around here and they used that as a resource, you know, a hunting area too. And then over the years, of course, they were drained, farmed, things like that too. So things have changed. The one site I look on, uh, basically, the stream is almost 500 yards away from the campsite, and I suspect at the time period they were there, that stream flowed right along the bank where they camped at. Sorry about that. So, so anyway, uh, some of the bigger villages, I'm sure you've all heard of them, Tioga Point, Queen Esther's Flats, uh, Shishikwin had a big village up there, Ulster, Tawanda, Wysox, Troy, Wyalusing, uh, all our major towns in this area basically had a big village located there. Uh, there were also a lot of little smaller satellite villages too. So um, a lot of times certain cultures, and I'm gonna refer to them as cultures, they would have one main village and then family units would move out, out into areas and they might live there for a whole summer and it might be 10, 12 people living there. And then winter time they would congregate again, make use of their resources, share their resources. And that site eventually they would have to move the main village, who knows why. There was one real critical resource that they exhausted. What do you think it was? Wood. wood. You're exactly right, yeah. They needed wood to make campfires and stay warm. So obviously moving farther and farther out and when I tell you how they actually got the wood, it, it was a long, slow process. They didn't have chainsaws and things like that. So <laughs> anyway, so they had to collect as much as they can and it, you know, and take fallen trees and work on those too. So, but eventually they'd run out of wood and village sizes grew to a certain point until they exhausted their resources. And then they would move to a new spot. Maybe 50 years later, they would move back to that spot once things recovered. So that's just a little snapshot there, you know, of what happened here. But basically, I pretty much all throughout Bradford County, I've heard of people finding Native American artifacts. So. Uh, Couple of the more famous ones, Spanish Hill uh, is a stronghold of the Carrots one, the Indians, the Susquehannocks. Uh, if you're familiar with Topps Market up there, uh, Tozier's Bridge where it used to be up in there, that's Spanish Hill, it's right along Route 17, right along the New York State border there. So that was basically a, a stronghold area for the Susquehannocks. And the Iroquois were a very warring, there was a League of the Nations, but they weren't real friendly. They would come down and try to force out different tribes, different uh, villages and things like that out of this area. And who knows why? Just cause it wasn't because they just liked to fight. It was for another resource. What do you think it was? Beaver. Basically all the top hats that uh, gentlemen used to wear back into late 17, early 1800s there were made out of beaver pelts and they would shave the hair down, dye it black. And in fact, any of you ever hear of Mad Hatter's disease? Basically, that's where it started from, in the hat factories. Uh, they were using mercury, I believe it was there, and to help tan the hides. And basically, that's what started to happen there. People started going sane using that, so. Uh, but anyway, it got to the point where there were so few beavers left in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Game Commission brought beavers back in and stocked them in the state of Pennsylvania. But the Iroquois wanted control of all the areas. 
to basically get furs and trade them so they could get different goods. So there was a lot of you know, wars that started over that too. Um, Tioga Point was the gateway to the north and as the legend goes and the story goes, the Iroquois took control of that and that's the juncture of the rivers between the Susquehanna and Chemung. Uh, and basically, if you were an early missionary that would went up to convert Indians to Christianity or whatever you wanted to go into New York State, you had to go through Tioga Point. There was no way around it. And basically, if they let you through there, they would send a scout with you. And if another tribe or another group or village saw a scout with a white person, a missionary, uh, they would let them alone. If you went up there by yourself, guess what happened? You, that was it, that was the end of you. So that's why they called it the gateway to the north, all right? Uh, Frieden shooting and wild loosing there, that was a Moravian missionary. And there's a very long history to that. Uh, there's a monument down there and a marker. Uh, but basically, a lot of those Indians or Native Americans were our first Christians in this area here too. And they had settled uh, in that site there. They had homes similar to what the early settlers had at that point there too. So Queen Esther's, a lot of you have heard about the Queen Esther's massacre down in Wyoming Valley and things like that. I could probably spend the whole night talking about all the different stories about that. So some people think it's not true. Other people think it's totally true. Some people said Queen Esther went up Tootlow Creek and hid up there after the Wyoming massacre. Other people said, no, she didn't. She settled on Queen Esther's flats up towards Athens up there. So there is just a treasure trove and a wealth of tales and stories. Uh, where I work at the park, Mount Pisgah, there's a, um, basically a Seneca chief settled up there. And the story goes a few of the local people that settled the area had killed him eventually. And uh, there's three or four families that claim fame to have killing, killed this chief there and buried, buried him. So, and so not all of them could be true. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, so anyway, the, the area is very rich in history. Uh, common question I get is what tribe lived here? A lot of them. I hate to say that, but there was a lot. Uh, basically, most of the Native Americans were Algonquin speaking, but if you went through the major time periods, for example, the Paleo Indians, uh, I said was about 12,000 years ago. Throughout the state of Pennsylvania, it's anywhere from 16,000 years before the present to about 10,000 years. Next time period was the Archaic period, about 10,000 to 4,300 years, and so on down transitional woodland. And then that was broken up in the early, middle, late historic, and the historic period was last about 1550 to 1750. So right, and there, of course the American Revolution followed that. So, so there was a lot of occupations here over time. And you know, some of the villages, people always ask me, you know, what's kind of numbers based on archeological estimates when they excavated long houses and different huts and things, there was probably a couple thousand Indians living here. And I've heard people say there was more than that, less than that. Uh, but one thing, what do you think wiped them out eventually? Disease. They had no immunity to most common diseases because they hadn't been exposed to them. So they died from smallpox, tuberculosis, a whole variety of different things there. And that eventually led to their demise there too. So, uh, and, and we're talking across the United States, thousands of them died from different diseases. So. But anyway, when you look at different points, and I have a chart up here in the front, that's archeologists based on digging down through the time, digging down into the dirt. Uh, they could estimate, basically if this point was found two feet deep, it was X number of years ago and so on. And you could imagine the closer we got to our time period, that uh, was more triangular points and they were up near the surface. Along the river, some of the sites are almost two feet deep. Anybody know why? Flooding and silt, yep. It was actually deposition. There were huge fires back then and they were burned out of control. There was no local fire company to put them out. So the areas were bare exposed mineral soils. They would wash into the river after heavy rains and keep building up on the flats. So you could see along the riverbank some of the occupation layers and they're as much as two feet down into the ground, which a farmer's plow is never gonna touch those. So there, there's, you know, real rich history, and then a lot of areas you could find flecks of charcoal where huge fires burned and things like that. So 
if we could only turn back the clock, we could see all that, but I doubt we ever will. <laughs> so anyway, but again, there's a chart up here. You could, you're welcome to take a look at that. And then each time period has its own unique artifacts. So some of them are up here uh, on the far right is a thing called a celt. And that was basically a tool they used similar to an ax that we would use today for chopping up different things. Uh, if you went into the center there, there's uh, pestles, there's some disc coils, fish hooks, uh, there's some grooves, uh, axes up in there. This artifact right up here in the top is actually a Civil War dimples in there. But that's a nutting stone. So they would put nuts in there, take another rock, pound on it, break the nut open, and then take the meat out of the nut, and then use that in stews or foods and anything else that they were making at that time. Uh, there's a groove stone down there that's all polished, so they would use sand on it to abrade it and polish it. It may take up to two weeks to make one of those stones like that. The dimples were actually pecked in with another stone and then smoothed out. So, uh, But there's ex examples of smaller ones up here, and on the end, there's a real big one down there, and that came from the riverbank not far from here. So. And then again, a wealth of different types of point styles and things like that. So it all came down to natural resources. So basically that's what they needed to survive. Uh, we talked a little bit about the beavers there, uh, how important the pelts were. They actually use beaver teeth, and I don't have any with me right here, but they used them for chisels uh, to carve wood and do things like that. So if they, and they would take the, the tail, anybody know what the tail was good for? There's a lot of fat in there. So they would cut the tail open, take the fat out. And even the early settlers said that the thicker the beaver tail, the longer the winter was going to be. So maybe the beaver knew something we didn't know. But anyway, uh, they used that as a resource there too. Some of the early accounts, they used bears. They were a very important food source. And it always amazed me. I read stories where there were trees that were you know, over 100 feet tall, and they had holes big enough to fit a four or 500-pound bear in it. 50 feet from the ground. So how they would actually get the bear out, anybody know? Fire. they build a fire around the tree, and if they couldn't get the bear out just by the smoke, they would actually let the fire burn into the tree and then chip away at the charcoal until the tree fell over, and eventually the bear would come down with the tree, and then they would kill the bear. And the whole village would use it too. And the settlers did the same thing too. Uh, sometimes they sent the kids up the tree, but that's a long story there, too. <laughs> anyway, so we're not going to do that tonight. So uh, other things I have found, you know, turtle bones, things like that. They use a variety of resources, things we wouldn't even dream of eating. Brains were probably a very important part of their diet. And I don't think, has anybody in here ever eaten a brain? Probably not. Okay. I did a long time ago, so I'll admit that. But anyway, uh, they use brains for tanning hides, too, as well. So, uh, so again, a lot of different resources out there, different trees, different types of nuts. Uh, the Susquehanna River used to be a, a mass migration route for American eels and also American shad. And they would come up the river by the thousands. And just south of the bridge here in Tawanda is actually an old eel weir where the Native Americans used to capture eels and use them in harvesting there too. And then they'd stretch nets across the river or portions of it to catch American shad, things like that. They made the nets out of fibers. I have some examples of that up here too. So uh, there was also seasonal movements too. So spring, summer, fall, winter, they moved to the resources where they were at. So if let's say the oak trees were all dropping acorns over on South Mountain, this year, that whole village may move there to exploit that resource. If there was an area where they were finding a lot of mussels in the river, they would move there and exploit those resources too. So they had specific areas they would move around toward, towards, you know, to find different things. Of course, fresh water was important, game species. There was a period in time where some of the history books said there was little or no game here at all. And that's hard to believe with all the deer and turkey around here, so, uh, but. Back then, they had exhausted their supplies. In fact, some of the shell pits that farmers plowed up, the big shells were on the bottom. As you move closer to the surface, the shells got smaller and smaller and smaller. So what does that tell you? They used them up. Yeah. So they weren't, a lot of people think they were the, you know, the great conservationists. 
And I'm sure they were to a certain degree, but they needed food to survive. And if you weren't just going to put these back because you knew they were going to be there in the future, it was food. So they made use of those there. Uh, different types of shelters. Basically, you've probably all heard about the longhouses. The Iroquois had longhouses. Um, and there were family units set up in there. So, you know, in an area about 10, 12 feet long, there may be 10 of you living in there. So how would you like that? If you passed away, guess what they did with you? In the winter, I'm sorry. What do you think? Well, they didn't throw you outside during the snow, but uh, you would think so, or dump you over the river bank, but the ground's frozen, so they obviously didn't have shovels or back hose to dig in there. They would actually put the fire out inside their lodges, and they would dig a hole into the soft ground underneath the fire because it never froze, and that's where you would be buried. So, and then come springtime, I'm sure you had to move there, but anyway, from that standpoint, but then they'd fill the hole back in, start the fire right up on top of that. So kind of amazing, you know. Um, you, you hear, you watch movies and everything's very sacred and this and that. And it was a very tough life. The Iroquois used to actually come down here and rob graves or burial mounds and then trade goods. So um, kind of amazing. But there's an example of some of their huts. They lived in rock shelters. Uh, the Troy Farm Museum out there had a replica of, of, basically, it's a wigwam there, out there. So, uh, and again, you know, very small area. You might have a whole big family living in here. Even some of the early settlers, they had 10 by 10, 12 by 12 cabins up here when they first came here in the 1700s, and the whole family would live in there. So it would be like me sitting right next to you for the whole thing. Would you feel comfortable with that? No. <laughs> Probably not. So anyway. <laughs> Um, artistic creativity, um, I know uh, there's a few clay pots up here that were brought along, you can look at those, and there's an example of a clay pot that came out of the river bank I brought along there. You can see some of the designs up in the top there. Uh, that was probably their most artistic things that they did. So we've seen, of course, they were very colorful when you go to, you know, some of the ceremonial dances, things like that. Uh, but you know, most of the photos we're used to seeing were black and white photos. And you don't think about all the vivid colors. They made their own tattoos. I found like little awls that they used to tattoo on their arms. And uh, I'm sure they used different plants and inks and things like that. They drew different carvings on stones, petroglyphs they call them. There's a example up there of a, a pennant with a, a design on it that somebody wore, you know, probably 3,000 years ago or so uh, as an ornament there. So, uh, but even when villages would uh, basically war with other villages close by for different territory, the women would be captured, taken back, and they were allowed to create their own style of pottery or use what they had previously used. So and we could see that in some of the examples up here too. So uh, it wasn't like you can't do this and there were a lot of rules and you can't do this and that here at our village. So it's interesting when you see that. Native American myths and legends, there's stories, if you get on the internet, there are so many stories. I do an astronomy program up at the park, and there's a whole story about why the moon's up there and how a rabbit helped establish the moon up there. Really interesting to hear about. But, you know, they tried to tell a lot of stories about things they saw in nature based on some of these things. For example, an eagle was a good omen, an owl was a bad omen. So if you saw an owl fly into your village, Probably a lot of bad things were going to happen, or at least that's what they talked about. If you saw an eagle along the river, you know, that, that's a different story there, too. So you'd have a lot of good luck. Down in the bottom there is Chief Watona. He was the fellow I talked to you about, was the uh, chief up there, basically up at Mount Pisgah on top of the hill there. So there's a big carving up at the county park up there, at Mount Pisgah County Park. So, and the fellow in the middle, some of you may recognize, he's from Troy right there, Bill Saxton. So uh, he does a lot of Native American programs, does an excellent job. His wife is kind of upset with him because he has to shave his head and then he tans his skin. He's as white as us. <laughs> so anyway, it's a, it's a, but he does an excellent job with programs too. So. so then European contact period, we had basically a lot of fur trade. I talked to you a little bit about the beaver pelts. I have a few of the European trade goods. Uh, just hold one of these up. Anybody know what? That was? 
it's basically, it's a trade good. The, the handle's prob probably not the original, it's a replica, but this part up top is, uh, they were basically, the Native Americans used these for scalping. Who, do you th who came up with scalping? Europeans. Europeans. Yeah, it wasn't the Native Americans. You hear about, they, they were these brutal savages and you know, all that. Well, basically, they learned from Europeans. The British were really big into scalping. So, anyway, so there was a lot of that. What's this part for? They used it, yeah, you can imagine getting hit in the head. I'm not going to try that here. Okay, but anyway, they'd use it for that, but they also called them gut rippers. So they would actually, literally, a lot of these had big hooks on them, and they would impale a person in a battle and pull out their intestines. Okay, which is horrifying to think of, but uh, that was a, pro well, that was loud. <laughs> anyway, prize tool there. So basically, what's the contact here in Kansas? Here's an example up here. Anybody know what they use this for? Okay, that was for eels. So they, it was an eel spear. It was hand forged, and then they traded it to the Americans. I found this up towards Athens along the river bank up there, but it was a gig, an eel gig. So that's what they used at that time. So a lot of the things I talked about previously and a lot of tools you'll see up here, they abandon. You know, if, you, if somebody gave you a steel axe, why would you use a stone tool? You'd stop using it. it copper kettles, I don't have any with me, but uh, if somebody gave you a copper kettle to cook in, what would you do with your clay pot? So a lot of things disappeared. They actually traded, you've heard about, you know, like the walk-in purchase and other things too. I only have three trade deeds from this county. So there wasn't a lot of trading going on here, but basically you might get several thousand acres for these th three trade deeds. So the early settlers would come in, bring different things like that. Uh, there was also an extensive network of trading between the Dutch and some of the colonists, and they would trade furs and pelts, give the Native American beads, of course, alcohol, glass, that different things like that. And it was a, a big bartering network, basically, more or less. But if you never had beads like this, they'd be quite valuable to you. So, uh, so again, very few trade deeds, basically because the time of trading, mostly the Iroquois controlled this area, and there wasn't a lot of Native Americans here. Here's a trade axe. This is about from 1650. So very similar to our own axe. Guess what they did over time with these? They kept trading for about 100 some years or so. This is a very large example. To save resources, guess what the Europeans did? They made them smaller. They can make more axes and trade more. So as you go through progression in time, the very oldest ones were the biggest ones and they would actually cut down the size. The Native Americans would take these and cut them up into pieces and make celts and things like I showed you there too. The copper kettles they would make into beads uh, different types of ornaments, stuff like that, too. So they didn't waste the resources. The first kettles that they gave to the Native Americans, you think you'd cook in them? Guess what? They made them into jewelry. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, and they thought, wow, why would somebody want to give me a kettle, you know, and when I could do this with it? So they wrote, made rolled beads, all sorts of different ornaments they would tie onto their clothes out of copper. So, so it's really a, a, you know, a lot of history. Anybody know what this is? a rattle so and this is animal hide it was brain tan and it's a it's just a replica but they could use that they could put small pebbles in there whatever inside of it and shake it around uh, I have a piece of cordage which is the one we were getting our things from earlier this is basically made out of the backstrap from fingers same thing here okay so this is a bow string where you guys can't actually hit it because you'd be going crazy mm -hmm. <laughs>
talked earlier to a few people, but anybody know what this is? It's a spear, okay? Uh, basically, it's another replica, so I didn't find this thing, but it's called an addle addle. Until this date, they still have competitions with it. So this is how they used it. So Tom's going to come in and run around. I'm going to try to hit him here, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> anyway, they use it like this. When they throw it, it was a lever, so it would throw out like that. And they said they were accurate up to 60 yards. They could hit an egg with this, so... And they have competitions all over the world today with this. This has a copper point on it. This is bamboo, so bamboo didn't grow here. But that's what, how most of the hunting occurred. The bow and arrow probably wasn't developed for maybe about 2,000 years ago. So prior to that, if you ever find an arrowhead has notches or stems into it, this is probably what it was fastened to at one point or intended to be fastened to it. So, um, and, of course, they've used – these are turkey feathers right here, so – but anyway, that's what most of it is. So the bow and everybody sees the movies with the bow and arrow. They really didn't have bow and arrow for thousands of years. So this was the main tool weapon for hunting here and for warfare. They hunted everything from woolly mammoths to, the, to deer uh, to even smaller, depending on the size of the arrow, too. Some of the uh, tips here were designed to detach so you could recover the shaft. They had stones, and there's one up here. They call them... Uh, Addle addle weights. There's one upstairs in the museum. Uh, it's basically a bird stone. They think they tied them on here and they used them as a counterweight to help get more thrust in behind them, too. So, because basically wood's not very heavy, so they put would tie stones on there. So, uh, and there's, I've seen quite a few examples of them, too. There's one up in the cave where you'll see a hole drilled through it there, too. So, uh, very important tool in the history. And there's a, some pictures of trade goods and things like that down there. And, and there were major trade routes. I have some jasper arrowheads up here that the stone that they used to make them came from down towards Emmaus, if you know where that is, Pennsylvania, Veracruz Jasper Pits. They walked it all the way up here and then made points out of it and used it. A lot of other stones, there's some uh, flakes up there. The rhyolite that came from down towards Adams County, Lancaster area down there. And they would trade it up the river. So, and they would send somebody from the village down. They might trade something they had, some material from up here that they couldn't get to another village and trade goods like that. Or go right to the quarry and bring it all the way back up here. So, uh, some of the early settlers accounts I read, there was one lady took a vacation to Philadelphia back in the 1700s. Guess how she got there? On foot. <laughs> so, so you could imagine that was a long vacation there. <laughs> anyway. But there was nothing, you know, it wasn't like there were all these towns and highways back then either. So uh, kind of interesting. So anybody have any questions? I know I don't want to take up too much more of your time here. Yep. Did you talk about Steve Cassell, that he actually did live around the Rhineland? Mm-hmm, yep. And, yep, and it, it's been relocated to another spot, basically out in western Pennsylvania now. So, uh, so that was it was apparently exhumed and moved. But there's a lot of different stories about him, and a lot of it doesn't make sense. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, there are a number of in the like Bradford County history books, and I'm sure the museum here has some too as well. There that they do reference to that there too, but. Uh, there's a lot of stuff online, too, that you could research and look up. But I know I've heard different people speak about Chief Watona, and there's a lot of conflict between them. So, so he was an actual yes. It no, it wasn't a myth. He was actually here, and I apologize if I made it seem that way there. But, yeah. Yeah. So I just – history is interesting. It's very important to keep track of, but I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, unfortunately. So, uh and uh, the tail grows taller down the line is, you know, there used to be a story, probably John could relate to this years ago. I, I know everybody in the office used to say, I used to work for the county years ago, but anyway, they'd say, if you told the story on one side of the county, by the time it got to the other side, it'd be a totally different story. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, you know, obviously they didn't write a lot of things down. Even the old history books, let's say you were uh, an author that wanted to sell your book. 
well, who would you write about? If Tina had millions of dollars, right, you do, right? No, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> would you write about her or me that only has $100? Probably Tina. So she's going to be more likely to write by the book. And, you know, so you're going to write a lot of stories about her and not necessarily about, you know, some of the more local people that were uh, struggling you know, to survive. I'm just using you for an example. I'm sorry. I'm not picking on you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, there is a, a one stone up there, basically. It, it's incised. They call it incising. But I'm sure there are certain rocks on the river that had different types of examples and carvings. I have a pestle, a big grinding stone that has turkey tracks on it that came from Bradford County too. So, so uh, but if you go down towards Harrisburg, there are some real well-documented uh, petroglyphs on the rocks down there. So, and what's interesting is, you know, we don't, nobody likes a drought, but we just really went through an, about a month of no rainfall. So the river elevation went down and exposed a lot of things, so. Yeah, so I'm sure we'll hear about some new things that were discovered too there. So, anyway, yeah. I have heard uh, rumors that um, there's a very large temple there. Mm -hmm. um, she's been found there. Okay. And that down in South Carolina. Okay. And that it's located in one small town, and then there was a lot of talk about of it. Of it, right? Yeah. Have you ever heard anything about that? I have, I have heard that, but I've never seen it. So, I mean, standing stone. Have any of you ever seen that? Yeah. Amazing. The fellow that originally owned that took me up to the top of the mountain. He said, this is where the rock came from. And it looks like if you pick that rock up and put it there, it'd fit right in place. And he said, his theory is it just slid down the side of the bank and then embedded itself in the mud there, which is amazing that it's been there for centuries, more or less. So anyway, but uh, I'm not gonna dispute it. <laughs> so anyway, but it's neat to see. Yeah, so it has a lot of history to it too. There was a legend about that when I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. That stone came down. So there you go. Yeah. 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 So uh, lots of stories, you know, like that. The ghost walk up by uh, Ulster up there in Shashikwin area there too. I've heard numerous different stories about that. So where people committed suicide basically that fell in love. So it's, uh, there, there's a lot of history, you know, in Bradford County. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So anyway, as far as that goes. So yeah. No, no, basically they were very nomadic at that time period. So um, there's one site they call it the Shoop site, which was basically an ambush site for caribou. Caribou used to migrate through Pennsylvania at one time. And they think basically that's all they came there for was to hunt caribou at that time period when they were migrating, probably for several hundred years or thousands of years. Uh, but they found points all around that area and different tools used to scrape hides and clean things up. A lot of the material came from all over New York State, all as far south as the Jasper quarries down in Emmaus and things like that. So, uh, but they, they've used the finest materials they could find for that. And they probably carried them with them. So, and that's how they survived. So, yeah, but. The Susquehannocks were here, yep. Yeah. Uh, basic, it was, yeah, yeah. But um, like prior to that, there was a Native Americans, they were called Lamoka Indians. They lived pretty much all over this area here. There's a lot of sites there. And they had very small, tiny points. So, uh, and you, there was different complexes, Brewertons, which weren't Susquehannocks. You, know, the whole, you could go on forever with all the different types of cultures. And like I said, they all had different tools that they would use, things like that. So. Uh, and that had gradually evolved. In fact, there's no distinct, you know, here's one one time period started in the other, so they seem to overlap a little bit with things there too, so. But the Susquehannock's very important, so, yeah. Was it possible for the Latin Kings to survive? Basically, as far as we know, yeah, yeah. Where they tried to tell different, depict different things there too. I'm sure they had some type of language, but that wasn't passed on. 
they estimated they used over 120 different types of plants for medicinal purposes. So today we probably use maybe two, you know, so. And most of it's all synthetic stuff, so. But, you know. Any other questions then? Hmm? Yeah. Um, see, Seneca, Chief Latona was a Seneca there. Uh, so Queen Esther, probably not exactly the same time period there. There was probably a, definitely a difference there in time there. So, and I'd have to research that. I apologize. I'm not real solid on the exact dates there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so anything else at all? No. Okay. Thank you. With that, I'd, I'll be around for a while if you want to talk about any of the artifacts up here. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it there. So, Yes. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I've been actually I started collecting back when Hurricane Agnes came through. So and at that time, I hate to date myself there, but uh, I remember going out with my dad and you know looking for things there too. And then uh, we were coming back from Maine, and he said he got stuck. We got stuck in a giant traffic jam. He said there were all these hippies smoking pot. And he said it was called Wood Wood something. He kept going, it was Woodstock. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but you know, I started, you know, back there in Agnes there and uh, start, I went up to Maine on vacation and a fellow up there gave me a couple artifacts that he had found. And when I got back home, I wanted, of course, you know, a little kid, you want your dad, mom, take you out looking for an arrowhead. Everybody wants to find an arrowhead. So yeah, so it just stuck with me. Yeah. Now I have, Way too many of them, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you done any research on the, the traffic jams that they use? A, a little bit, yeah. Most of our major highways follow Native American Indian paths. So, and of course. Yeah, and that was basically the one that went up through Tioga Point there, too. And that was. That's why they called it the Forbidden Path. If you didn't make it past Tioga Point, you didn't make it anywhere, basically. So you had to get their approval. Some of the early missionary reports said they'd sit there for up to a week and no one would speak to them. And then finally someone would come forward and say, okay, we'll take you up here. So, you know, do that. So, but yeah, there was a lot of different paths. So you can imagine they followed a lot of the tributaries and streams up through here too, so. Uh, the Iroquois raided uh, all the way over into Ohio, all the way down into the Carolinas. So they really moved around a lot and, of course, made use of all those paths, too. And, of course, you know, ambushed people and things like that in a lot of different places. So, so. There is a burial they found out in Burlington that was pretty darn close to that, that they measured there, too. There's also stories of up towards Athens, they dug up a burial that had basically had horns on its head and it was nearly seven feet tall. Yeah, yeah, right up near there, so, yeah. And the Caratawans, the Susquehannocks were supposedly giant people, giant warriors, they called them. They were six feet plus. So you could imagine just running into someone that was six foot tall back then. They didn't need an arrowhead. <laughs> They're probably pretty intimidating. Uh, there's pictures of them throwing whole big clay pots off of their palisades, you know, forts that they had and things like that. So, but um, lots and lots of history. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I know what you're saying, yeah, yeah. Well, it made sense, you know, a lot of the early highways that were built here followed the paths. It was easier to clear. Some of the early settlers didn't leave. You, you know, they might raise a crop. They'd be stuck all winter in basically in their home there until springtime came to get out. And it, it wasn't until, like, into the early 1800s when they actually started building roads the original roads that General Sullivan came up through uh, the county up here, they called them corduroy roads. They used tamarack 
and they basically lay those down in swamp areas and they would take their cannons howitzers they had uh, across them and you know they had all sorts of livestock and things like that too that they took with them for food so it's uh and i'm sure we modified those changed them you could still see remnants of some of the old roads you know in the county here too so but, yeah. okay oh i'm sorry yeah That's a good point, and I've had people tell me that. You, you ever see a tree that's bent over? Yeah, well, most trees, I mean, back then, they were looking at what they called virgin timber. Uh, they were huge trees, maybe four or 500 years old in some cases. Some areas, they, I've actually heard people said, when I asked for permission to go look for Indian artifacts and things like that, farmer would tell me there were no Indians here because it was too dark. There were great big uh, hemlock trees or pine trees, and it shaded out all the sunlight, you know, in a lot of these different spots here, too. But getting back to those trees, if you think about how we've cut trees over the years, there's probably none of those left anymore, you know, because they just didn't, you know, the, probably the oldest trees in the county are only maybe 300 years old, maybe 400 years, and the Native Americans disappeared, you know, long before that, so. so I think a lot of those trees were damaged in storms by wildlife, deer, maybe things like that, and then they were left grow because of their uniqueness, or you know, for pasture trees, shade trees, things like that. So, I don't think there were Indian markers. No, I think they're pretty much all gone. Yeah. Now rock piles, different story. I've heard of uh, rock piles being put up on mountains, and they would find those and then use one after another to get their way around. So, and of course, rocks are going to be rocks for a long time there so anyway yeah so anyway but very good question so so anyway thank you all for listening and uh, appreciate you coming out tonight i hope you enjoy the evening and i'll be around for a little while here so yep
Did anyone leave a phone in the ladies' restroom? A phone was okay. I didn't. I didn't find it. Some somebody else found it. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long. Oh, you're